Our guest on this episode of the podcast grew up living in San Diego, California, and his first fishing experiences began with trout and other freshwater species as a kid. Fishing became a passion that only increased exponentially with his first exposure to saltwater fishing. After years in the tech industry, our guest and his partner, Jason Hayashi, took the leap of faith to make their love of fishing a business itself. The proliferation of BloodyDecks.com fishing forum and now BD Outdoors, an online magazine, has launched them into the forefront of web-based entertainment, information, and marketing. In 2016, our guest and his good friend and partner, Captain Rush Maltz, have produced, hosted, and grown one of the most entertaining and cinematic fishing shows on television, Local Knowledge. The show explores the culture of fishing itself and follows real-life characters that spend their lives dedicated to fishing and the outdoors. For the past seven seasons of filming, our guest has been fortunate enough to experience some of the most incredible fisheries that the world has to offer. He has pursued many species of saltwater fish from Guatemala to Magdalena Bay in Mexico to Prince Edward Island, Canada to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and beyond. Season 7 of Local Knowledge begins on April 20th with new episodes airing every Sunday morning all the way through September. Locally, our guest has been dialed in on the epic bluefin tuna bite that has been occurring offshore of San Diego for the past several years. In this conversation, we get a chance to compare notes on our respective tuna fisheries, we discuss tactics, fish behavior, and we just generally nerd out on tuna fishing. All of it accompanied by many laughs, awesome fish stories, and a ton of great knowledge shared. Without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Captain Ali Husseini of Local Knowledge TV. Welcome to the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast, where we follow three words of wisdom. You can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight. Coming up or what? Get that down. Don't get on that rock. How you, how you doing? I'm doing okay. How about you boys? Good. Good. Just trying to get through this winter. Yeah, we're both battling the sniffles. So uh, if we have to take uh, nose blowing breaks, we apologize in advance. That's totally fine. Now, are you guys, is it thawed out there? Or is it still cold as hell? It's thawing out. It's like. S- 50 here it's yeah. gonna be 70 here friday it's like roller coaster between 40 and 60 degrees for the next couple of weeks okay we're sort of doing the same thing i live like i don't know 15 or 20 miles inland from the beach and so it's like 40 in the morning 80 in the afternoon kind of stuff but yeah we're, we're we're starting to see signs of spring fishing which can't come fast enough it feels good doesn't it Oh man, I'm telling you, this time of year is like I'm Jones, and to get back out there, we went out, we just went bottom fishing the other day, and it was just nice to run the boat. Nice, That's awesome. When does your when does the meteor season start? I mean, yellowtail typically starts this time of year, like uh, middle of March is when we start seeing them. We've had a couple little flashes, but not the real migration. They come up the coastline from Baja, and so when they come up, they come up in mass, and it, it really gets going good in April. But you know the for the guys that know what they're doing, you can go out and still have a few nice scores on typically bigger fish too at this time of year. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's like just on the edge of, you know, things about to pop off. So, and we got a little tuna down the beach a ways, which is so unnormal for us. I mean, I can't even tell you. It's, it's even hard to describe to somebody who didn't grow up here. That's crazy. You guys are having some, I mean, we'll get into all that, but you guys are having some wild changes over there some of the best fishing on the planet. Yeah. I mean, I don't even think anybody, it'd be hard to argue with me, you know, like it's been the last few years, starting with that El Nino in 15, everything just got shook on its axis. And it's like, it, I, nothing surprises me anymore. You know, since 2015, we caught Wahoo locally, which was never, ever recorded. We got thousands of them, you know, and then we went, we had everything from whale sharks to full grown manta rays to blue marlin black marlin spearfish i mean all this weird shit that we would what? never see just showed up out of the blue because it all came from the west like out by hawaii normally 
the, the long range boats are going up and down the coast, right down below Cabo and all that. So they kind of intercept stuff on the way traveling. And then we learn what's coming. Basically, hmm. this stuff came straight out of the West. And all of a sudden there was guys getting their jigs chewed off. And we don't know anything about that shit. Dude, I can't twist a piece of wire to save my life. <laughs> I just, so you're it, learning it's not, immediately. <laughs> you're, <laughs> to, oh, dude, yeah. it was like went from every tackle store on the West Coast had 10,000 marauders to had zero marauders. It's unreal. It was just crazy. I mean, if you're a sport fishing geek like me and, you know, I really love the history of, of Southern California fishing. It's it's never been like this in recorded history. It was the biggest El Nino ever. And then we've gone into this bluefin cycle on the heels of the El Nino, which I think changed our current patterns and started pushing just tonnage and tonnage of anchovy into our water. And that, from what the scientists tell us, is what has kept them around. Normally, they'd migrate when they get like 60, 80 pounds back over to Japan and get killed, unfortunately. Yep. But now they just stay here year round until they reach like that 300 pound mark. Wow. And then they take off. And Dude, the shit we've seen, it's just, there's no words. So you guys are used to it, you know, and, and it's, that's your fish. It's not ours. Not this right. way. We're not used to you changes know? though. I mean, we're not, we're seeing a little small, you know, small changes with bait. Yeah. Like bait Ch biomass. You know, we're getting north, a ton of like Bonito that. and weird chub mackerel and things like that, but it's not major predator fish changing, you know I mean? I'm like sure real we probably Benito won't. with teeth. Oh yeah. oh yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even know you guys had those until a few years ago, and I'm like, that's the same as ours. It's right. crazy. And we get these real small ones in the bay. So like north of the Cape, the the bait source is slightly different than south of the Cape, just because of water temperature. But we were getting like massive, massive schools of these mini bonitos and the Full blue, blue, blue fins blowing them up out yeah. of the water. Wild. Sick. Yeah. yeah. Sick we stuff. only really see ours eat our, our basic bait and 90% of what they're eating. Well, that's not true. So we had that red crab around for the first few years of this. And it's they look like little crawfish, basically. And they would just gorge on them. And you'd see them on your meter, like down anywhere from 50 to 200 feet massive clouds of them yeah and you'd have to basically switch them over from red crab where they can just swim through that with their mouth open and eat all they want to get them to eat a bait and it was tough at times and that was even like to our bottom fish one of the fish that i love to catch is i love to go rock fishing when we're not tuna fishing just because it's easy beer drinking you know and they're okay. delicious and like you couldn't catch a freaking rock fish they'd be on these spots you'd see it on your meter we just drive away from it huh. and then that turned into anchovy later in the season but eventually the red crab dried up and now it's primarily anchovy they'll eat some squid when they get out by the island but the majority of what we see we don't see them eat bigger baits um we don't see them ch chasing baby yellowtail or doing any of that it's pretty much all anchovy sometimes they're on a ball of sardines sometimes they're on a ball of mackerel but primarily it's that anchovy that's cool dude we could i, f I feel we're, like this could be a we're gonna dive back 20 into, hour podcast into bluefin tactics and comparing fisheries but first we're gonna start with random rapid fire i'm not sure if you listen to any of our podcasts but we do the, the very beginning typically we, we do a rapid fire of random questions and whatever the first thing that comes to mind answer however you please usually there's they're mixed with funny ones and, and serious ones and if we go off on tangents so be it. That's the beauty of them. Exactly. Um, yeah, all good. So, number one, fishing pet peeves. Pet peeves on a boat. Do you have any pet peeves? Oh, dude, I'm so irritable on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> when things aren't going my way, I get crabby. I just go sit in the tower by myself. A little bit of everything. Number one, sunflower seeds. Don't ever bring effing sunflower seeds on oh, any boat same, that I'm anywhere near. Same here. Dude, the Peanuts. worst thing ever. <laughs> Oh, that's not, dude, peanuts aren't even in the question. You can f swim back if you're going to do that. Stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, I try to run a really tight ship. You know, there's only so many things that I can control in a day of fishing. So I kind of, I mean, if you're going fishing with me, it's kind of going to be my way because it's proven it works. I'm sure you guys are the same way. And I'm not a charter guy. I do guide a lot, but it's not like I have, I don't know. I don't have a different set of clients come on the boat every day. I've got four or five guys that I fish with a, a lot. And then my buddies. Yeah. And I just like you, your shit has to be tight, dude. And, and you guys know as well as anybody, it's like you might get one bite all week. Right. Yeah. And if that's the only bite you're going to get and there's like and you slip on failures, sunflower seeds, <laughs> tackle failures, unacceptable, not right. being ready, unacceptable, not having a backup for your backup, unacceptable, like that's the, my preparation is like that would probably be my biggest pet. You guys get on the boat like undersized gear. Dude, don't even bring that crap on my boat. We're right. going to go hunt elephants today or mini elephants compared to yours, you know, so I want the right gear. I see somebody put 20 pound in the water because there's a bunch of small fish splashing around. 
Oh man, trying <laughs> yeah, to dodge. yeah, that's great. What about uh, what about superstitions? No, I don't have any of that stuff. I'd be superstitious, but it's unlucky. No, I'm just that I'm not superstitious at all, dude. We eat freaking bananas just to piss people off and all that. I don't I don't buy any of that shit. I believe in math, not superstition. You know, work hard, good stuff happens, all the rest of that stuff I, I got no time for. You and Carraro. I think you and Carraro are the Same. two that have had zero superstitions. Eh, waste of time. Find yep. something else. Fish harder, work harder, good stuff will happen. Yeah, I I just feel like it's an excuse. I mean, it's funny I on a charter you. because you can kind of pick on somebody. Yeah, it's for a good wearing... excuse with the charters, right. for sure. Like Joe, yeah. Joe Ferruli had uh, a guy with a red coat on the boat. And now, from, from now on, he had a horror story day with a guy with a red coat. So he no, has no longer, there's, there's no guys with red coats ever stepping foot on his boat exactly. ever again. <laughs> you know, like stupid stuff like that. Yeah, um, I would put that back on you. If yeah. you suck at fishing, <laughs> don't blame a red coat. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Everybody has bad days. We've all been there. I suck horribly at times. Like, dude, don't blame somebody's coat or a banana or something else. Just admit the fact you suck. Go home. Wake your wounds. Just a practice day. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Wash it away with some whiskey and try again tomorrow. (laughs) I love a good whiskey. Um, All right. Railrod. You started there. (laughs) Railrod, fighting chair, or stand up for a tuna fish? It just depends on what you're doing, man. It all works. I'm, I've never caught a single fish in a chair in my life. I do not plan to until it's the only way that I can catch a fish. Huh. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's just not my thing. Even when we go to PEI and catch giants, we always use the harness. That surprises <laughs> and, me that you never jumped in the chair up there. No interest. I, I just I'm, I'm still young enough. I was a lot younger then. I'm strong, and I, to me, it's just not that sporting. Honestly, I don't yeah. rifle hunt. Let me put let me put it that way. Yeah. Yep. Give me a bow. I want to kill everything. Give me a rifle. Eh. Just it kind of takes away from it for me. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I sound like a fly fisherman, but I'm definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Feather merchant. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite location that you've tuna fished? Ah, uh, Puerto Vallarta. Just so many memories, so many giant yellowfin, as big as they can possibly get. These bluefin are awesome, but anybody who tells you they pull like a yellowfin's out of their mind. Uh, a bluefin next to the boat is a turd compared to a, a big yellowfin. Those yellowfin are trying to cut you off on the prop. They're going to send you around the boat 30 times. I mean, we did an episode down there. Rush got his first one over 200. It was like 20, 208 or something. I mean, that dude's built like a Donis, and it almost killed him. And they're just mean <laughs> ass fish. Hold on, what's he built you like? Know? Adonis. <laughs> Adonis. <laughs> like, I'm the fat, funny guy. He's a big, strong guy. It's like it's he's it brought him to his knees. I mean, he was scabbed up, beat up. Bluefin's just not going to do that to you in that same size class. Um, I love catching bluefin. Don't get me wrong. I'm super grateful they're here, but and, and it's probably because I'm jaded now. I catch so many big bluefin, or I have the opportunity to. But yellowfin for me, man, they just hold a special place in my heart. Yellowfin over 300 pounds. Oh, dude, that's that's it. Big that animals. is it. We don't get them that yeah. big over here. We've been just we've been getting a good run the last two or three years, like 100, 150 pounders, but very rare. That's yeah. super dude, those rare are to get over so that. much fun, though. And yeah. that's the best eating size is a buck and a quarter. That's the perfect, you know, steak to throw on the grill or whatever. And honestly, if I had my choice, I probably would like to catch 150s just because they're fun. It's not a... You know, we land like with a good angler and a rail rod on my boat. We're landing three, you know, close to three hundred pound bluefin. Twenty minutes. You know, try that with a yellowfin. You hook a yellowfin over two hundred pounds. There's almost no way you're going to land it less than an hour. You wow. know, it happens. Don't yeah. get me wrong, but it's an hour plus commitment. You get one of those big angry two eighty fives or whatever. Man, you could be there for two and a half hours, and that just does not happen with with bluefin. And I think that's why I'm just so crazy. And, there's those Allison fins. Like we went to Fiji and we caught a couple of, Oh God. It's like, that's just like, that's pornography. For it really is. Yeah. Man. I, it, it gets me so fired up, you know? Yeah. So oh, no, I, I like those. Blow a hole in my I've jeans. Yet, I've yet about to get an Allison. Things. You got a few last year. Yeah. Or two years two ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Our Mexico ones don't get the big sickles. I mean, they do over two and a quarter, 250, but you aren't getting a 160 pound fish where you can see it's Allison's have rubbed off on its tail kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and I don't know That's what extreme. it is, man, but those. Yeah, it's, it is just, it's so cool. And those Fiji fish have it, the Gulf have it, fish have it to a degree, but some of those more tropical places, it seems like they just get really long. And, you know, they thought those were a separate tuna altogether. They used to call them an Allison tuna, and the, the science proved it wrong when they did the DNA testing. Hmm. Interesting. 
We do get yeah. some. There's like like that 105 inch to like grander size blue fins. Occasionally, we'll get them with like you know streamers, not we like yellow fin sickles, but yeah. like they'll, they'll you know easy to move in the water. You start dragging them backwards, you notice them folding over. They usually break off pretty quickly, but they're cool. They're I pretty. caught one in PEI with Tony and those guys, and we have it all on film. We have the bite on film. We have it underwater. We have the kite just dangling off the side of the boat, and that thing had. Two and a half foot long Allison fins on it. Yeah, it was. Cr- I mean, the fish weighed a grand, a better than a grand, but the the fins on it stuck out. We were calling them sickleback because we were sitting there hand feeding them, you know, for a while, and we we're trying to keep the bait away from them because nobody wanted to mess with a fish that big. <laughs> and then finally, I'm like, I'm like, oh, how many chances did you get to catch a 1,200 pound blue fin? Yeah. Dropped it right in his mouth and and went to work, you know? Yeah, sick. No, that's cool. That's Wild. so cool. Hey, you fish, wonder if you that... guys have? Go ahead. I, I want that eyeball over 200, man. I want that fish so freaking bad. We've only caught a few of them here over the years. We used to have a lot of them back in the day, but my understanding is, is they seen them down off Panama now on those fads with the satellite trackers mm-hmm. on them and stuff. We never see them anymore. Huh. 2004, we had a run of them anywhere from 20 pounds to like 200 pounds. I caught a bunch of medium, like 60 and 80 pound ones, but that was it. I would kill to catch a big eye over 200. Those 70 inch fish are no joke oh like they, that 190 plus pound right big eye is a no I, joke i would animal. love to hear what your thoughts are fighting wise of a big big eye and a big elephant yeah. you know once i would like to see side by side like the, the biggest differentiator like people get in that argument all the time here because the long range guys you know yeah catch so many yellowfin dude cut the tail off a 200 pounder and lay it next to the tail of a 200 pound bluefin right end of story yeah mm, right. it's twice as big so I don't know where a big eye's tail fits in there, but that is definitely a big, bigger. Is it than a yeah, bluefin? Yeah. yeah, I would imagine it's a lot closer to a yellow, and that's a big rotund. It is fat, so freaking fat. Yeah, and dark meat. Mm-hmm. I think that gives them more stamina. You know, when we're talking about eating tuna, big eye's top of my list. Yeah, yeah same. I love eating. It's big so eye, good, man. so good. Yeah, once you eat enough bluefin, I know you guys uh, I know as well. It just it's yeah. almost too. It's too rich. I don't, I don't like. To do with it. We don't eat honestly. <laughs> it, we don't even if charters offer us extra pieces off the stuff we're catching in the bay just the fact that they're eating herring and stuff i don't love it yeah but when they're eat when we catch them in the canyons they're on squid diet and all that they're pretty damn good but the herring the herring fish not for me yeah one meal a yeah. year honestly yeah i don't i yeah. don't touch it either i and it's something to do like when we they first showed up dude, we were making pokey bowls with toro I mean, like disgusting. It's like <laughs> eating sticks of butter, dressed in butter with butter <laughs> oh, on top. Oh my god! You know what I mean? We're like, this is the greatest stuff ever. And I just anymore, man. I go to my sushi bar. He gives me like two beautiful pieces of toro on rice with whatever shit magic they do on there. It's the best thing ever, and that's all I want to eat. Like, it's just not my thing. People go crazy. It's like lobsters. I don't. We catch a lot of lobsters here in the bay. I don't like eating them that much. I'd rather eat a good piece of fish. You give those away to people though. And they lose their mind. Hundred percent. You know, most people, n- nobody hands anybody a slab of toro that weighs three pounds, right? Or a lobster or whatever. So I just I hand it out, and man, we give away a lot of fish. It's great. It's great. I love yeah. trading. 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 One of the, the funnest parts of being a fisherman. Done. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And when I I eat a ton of game. I eat a ton of fish, but just bluefin is kind of off the menu. Yell- cooked yellowfin on the grill. Oh, dude, I'm there all day. It's the best. Delicious. You know. All right. If um, you if you could time travel. Where and when would you go to fish? Dude, I think about that all the time, as random as it sounds. <laughs> I don't know, because, like, who the hell wants to fish with all that shitty old gear? Like, you get, well, you, here's you know? the thing with this question, though. You get your you get to take the CV, everything that you have now, oh, in the time totally machine changed. with you. Yeah. God dang. I would, dude, I would love to have fished Cabo. You know, in the 50s, 60s, when the stories the guys tell us are just like, and, and our guys from our coast didn't really discover it until the mid 60s. And a lot of those older captains have become good friends and mentors of mine. And the stories they tell about catching striped marlin on the anchor 20 feet off the beach, you know, that kind of stuff. Wow. I think for the diversity, I'm a tuna geek. Like you guys, all I want to catch is tuna. If it really came down to it, like that's it. Okay, you, you know, you got to go catch yellowfin on poppers for the rest of your life. I'd be totally fine with that. <laughs> um, I think I think it would be Cabo because you catch rooster fishes, fish on the beach. You got striped marlin close to shore. You got blue and black marlin. You got pargos in the rocks. And then you've got the, the yellowfin. I think I would 
I, I can't even imagine when that was untapped and there was no saners and no commercial pressure. Uh, I'd have died a very happy man. And we get glimpses of that when we fish Mag Bay. I mean, if you guys haven't done Mag Bay yet, we have. Do we it have. Now. We fished Cabo three or four times. We haven't fished Mag Bay, though. Yeah. One has nothing to do with the other anymore. Get to Mag in November or October, November. It'll just change the way you look at fishing. I mean, when you see acres of striped marlin, it's just, there's nothing like it. it, it the amount of life and the sea lions mixed in on a bait ball and there's sharks and there's whales and there's marlin and mahis and just fish as far as the eye can see. It, it gives you a glimpse. I feel like, you know, into a different time. Mm. And I, I compare mag to like, you know, the wildebeest crossing the Sahara or wherever the hell that, you know, the plains in Africa, when you see all that stuff with all that life headed the same direction, chasing water. I mean, that's exactly what happens at mag so much life it's just unbelievable and the bottom fishing gets no attention there but there is epic grouper fishing yellowtail fishing snapper fishing i mean it's it is it's it's a little slice of what i envisioned that the good old days looked like you know oh, that's awesome imagine 75 years ago with the gear you have now oh dude it'd be insane i can't i, I don't even know what you do you temp charts like and I said, all this stuff if i had Totally. If you had to use like that leather thumb patch and the linen line and the wood rods, I'm like, eh, it's probably <laughs> stick where I'm at. Yeah. You know, but oh, yeah. yeah, back then, I, dude, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, we've seen stuff in Puerto Vallarta that just, when it was first discovered in the early 2000s, that would blow, you, you could be walking mm -hmm. a skipjack around and get a double with a 60 pound pargo and a four or 500 pound black marlin. You could get a yellow fin and a black marlin. You could get a 40, 50, 60 pound Dorado and a yellow fan. I mean, just like the weirdest stuff that I don't think you're going to see in too many places on earth anymore. Huh. No, the diversity there is spectacular. The, the footage you guys have got in the show fishing there and other, you know, unreal other things we've seen. It looks ins absolutely insane over there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're very, very fortunate. We've got some very talented guys that produce the show and we just, honestly, we work a little bit harder. We always take an underwater camera guy, which most shows don't do. We shoot reds above the water and below the water. So any of that slow-mo stuff that you see, like we're getting it in 8K at like, I don't even know if they shoot 120 frames per second or something yeah. crazy. Oh so, God. And it gives us a bunch of still images that we can pull out of that right. and then use for promotion. It's awesome. It's been a lot of fun. And it's more, it's way more fun to get it on film than it is to catch a fish because it's so hard to make them cooperate. Oh, absolutely. Um, this this goes along with time traveling, sort of. Uh, what if you were to have one superpower in present day? What would it be? <laughs> I don't know. That's a really weird question. Uh, if you fly. Need, if fly, fly, same here. The Gannett. Fly. Everyone wants to be a Gannett. Yeah. Yep. I'm telling you, no, like jet speed. Oh, okay, like flying, very flying quick. commercial suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's true ah, no, i think it would be dude. flying for sure pop over to the keys for a little bit pop home i yeah, know i think that would be it flying especially what you got going on um you've gone over that fish to eat what's the weirdest thing you found in a tuna stomach at home specifically at home the blue fins you're catching in your backyard you know in the tunas we don't find that much weird stuff it's like i was saying it's basically the stuff that we talked about um, we found all kinds of weird crap in Dorado and Wahoo and other fish like that. But our tuna are basically, we have so much fin bait. I mean, that's the draw here, right? They're not, they're not eating much else other than that fin bait or squid. Um, I'm trying to think if we've ever found like a, a baby tuna or anything like that. Trash, and like any like commercial bycatch trash and nothing no, like that. And to really? be honest, I don't cut my own tuna that often. We have the long range processors. And we have a deal with one of them where, oh, you know, wow. we trade them promotion and they cut our fish for us. So it just, it makes my life so much easier. I even leave them in the fish hold. And then I've got a business down there. One of my guys, I pay him a few bucks. He goes, takes them out of the hold. He drops them off. I just go pick up beautiful, perfectly processed, vacuum sealed, labeled fillets, which is just like, it's all comes from the long range business. You know, those guys have been doing that for years. And for these big tunas, it just, it works perfect for us. You can hand somebody a product they can throw right on the grill or, you know, chop up and make pokey or sushi out of or whatever. That's an incredible I wish collaboration. I wish we had that. Yeah. Oh. I mean, there's so much wasted and, fish by us. It's absurd. And, and it's exactly what happens, man. And the yeah. only other place I've ever seen anything like it is Alaska. And I was telling, I've been telling Russian the keys, man, he needs to open a service like that because, you know, a lot of these guys do want to take home fish, but instead they get a vacuum or a, what do you call it? Ziploc bag 
friggin' iceberg, uh, you know, that sits on the back of the freezer. And you know, and I know, probably gets thrown away half the time. It's just, you aren't doing the fish any service. You're not doing yourself any service, you know? Yep. And these guys are like, they're 75 cents a pound or something for a fish in the round. So a 200 pound fish, you give them 150 bucks and it comes back 100% beautiful. No bloodline, no skin, no nothing. Perfectly wow. vacuum packed in one pound chunks or two pound chunks, depending on what you specify. That's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. Huh. We got to get you guys out here and see how we do it, man. I'd love to learn from you guys out here as well. I feel like we're in our infancy with figuring this thing out. And by the time we do, these fish are going to go away. This is not going to last forever, you know? And so I, I'd, I'd love to get you guys here and learn. We should do a little swap. We should have you and Rush and come here and then we'll go there and fuck around for a little while. I'm all about it. I'm all, and we're probably fishing when you guys are already have it packed in. I mean, we're still, we're, we're fishing up until Thanksgiving typically. Yeah, we're done. I mean, so, charter wise, we're done around Halloween. So November is prime time for us to be able to get away. It's, it's, yeah, stay in touch. As long as the weather doesn't screw us. Last year, dude, we lost the last six or eight weeks of our season. We've had the two windiest seasons since like 04, 05. It back to back. It has sucked. We have very, very fair weather here. It is one of the best things about fishing in Southern California. We're protected by the Channel Islands. So that knocks down any big weather coming our way. And we just typically have very stable weather. You know, that's what San Diego is known for. So through the, you know, through the summer and fall, I mean, fall is our favorite time to fish. All the Arizona guys and all the weekend warriors, they kind of put their shit away at Labor Day, you know, and go do whatever, soccer practice or football or whatever. And we have these fall days where it's just the boys out there. You don't have the big crowds. And, man, there's some great fish. If I had to pick a month to fish here, it'd be October. Hands down. I don't have to think about it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah October here is our, like, prime time, too. Fall tuna fish really? is a special thing. Yeah, it is. It is. That's a good dog. So? For us, they're, yeah, on the migra- they're on their migration out. The water temperature is cooling down. Uh, their tolerance for colder water is a little bit more than when they migrate in. So they're just like, I guess the best way to compare it is like they're getting ready to travel deer hunting in the rut. They're not, they're not, oh, okay. they're not mating, but they're just like stupid. They are stupid. And they're, oh, they're, they're getting okay. ready to travel too. Like these, you know, monstrous miles. So it's, it's, uh, you know, they're packing on, they're packing on the pounds. They're eating everything they see. For the and, most part, you can fish heavier leader. You can, you can, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah, we don't see that. When we know when ours start to get, fi- get fidgety and they want to move, you know, they'll settle up out at, at San Clemente Island or out at the Tanner Bank. Um, typically, a lot of my season is spent at, at San Clemente Island, the bulk of it. But like last year, they skipped it. They went right to the Tanner Bank. San Clemente is 65. Tanner Bank's 100. Oh. So we like San Clemente. But the trade-off we got last year was is they hung out out front way longer than they normally would. I mean, I was running out, I'm not joking, 20 something miles, throw a couple 200 pounders on and be back for lunch. Sick. It was uh it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Pretty and they did that for longer than normal, but once they left, dude, it was it's straight 100 mile runs into the swell the whole way. Yeah. I mean, it it'll wear you out. And then the thing you're coming home in the dark and you don't you can't come home from 100 miles in a center console. You know, we're we're moving, we're flying at night. Probably not the smartest thing we're ever going to do, but fortunately, there's not a lot of boat traffic or anything out that way. The amount of caffeine consumed must be fucking exponential. Dude, and you're so shot after an exciting day of blow-ups and bites and gaffing fish and shit breaking and screaming and high fives and crying and <laughs> you know like that's uh, dude, it's a long day but one thing we notice is the fish as the season goes on they tend to bite way better in the afternoon i mean i can't even tell you in in october and november a lot of times we get 75 percent of our fish after 5 p.m hmm. so we leave the dock at night you know, we take our time getting off the dock. That gets you out to the grounds in a fast boat by noon, kind of get your shit together, figure out what's going on, where they're at, where they're hanging out, and then be ready for those afternoon hours. And sometimes you won't have anything, and then you'll land four in the last couple hours of the day. Is it tide-related, or is it just like... 100%. Yeah. They bite so much better on the tide. But they float. We we see them down on our meters at 500 feet, 300 feet. And then when when we start to get into a tide, they'll just float up to the surface. And then they'll start breezing, which I don't know how much of that you guys get, but we'll have them up and breezing or they'll be just subsurface, you know, 75 feet, something like that. And then you flop a flying fish on a school at 75 feet down. It's just game on early in the season. It's a lot more surface fishing. Typically we see them, you know, breezing and you just see their fin tips tickling the water. You see a flash of a shiner from the tower and you kind of just chase that moving water. 
try to get a little bit up ahead of it and throw a flying fish into it more times than not it's game on it's kind of the same here pushing too. pushing fish is what we call yeah it. early season okay. a lot of pushing yeah. fish migrating in there in the top you know half of the water column then they start to get settled water starts warming up you know if the herring is around which it has been in the summer months for us the last handful of years here that's when they start you know we're fishing lower half of the water column for most of the summer and then how deep 100 and 100 feet to 150 feet anywhere from 95 Shallow. to 200 that's just stupid it is uh, it's good. i mean so it's pei fishing basically it's basically the same yes. but it's not like you're not hand feeding yeah it's yeah. some some feeding. days it's almost almost feels like you're in pei but yeah um it's, just, it's like fishing I, fisherman's bank on like a normal day like a like a non hand feed day or like drifting off the lake, it's kind of similar. But we're fishing on anchor ninety percent of the time. You know that other ten percent is split between trolling and drifting in the spring slash well early summer, and then we do a little bit of drift fishing and stuff in the fall when they start to breeze again in the fall and their migration out. Yeah. yeah, the bulk of our fish have come well drifting or moving very slow, presenting a kite. But the spreader bar thing here in the last two or three years has just gone bonkers. And like I'm doing seminars and stuff. If you are not an experienced fisherman and not a technical fisherman, you want to go out and catch a nice fish. And we don't get the big, big ones on the spreader bar typically. Typically the ones they're getting are 60 to 150 pound. But as you guys know, spreader bar fishing is not scientific. If you can, you know, manage to hit the water with it and get it behind your boat, you're probably going to get something. Mm -hmm. It's just the easiest way for these guys to get into it and get fired up. But when they're dragging now, you know, they caught one on the spreader bar last year and we're trying to bait breezers and stuff. And you have some clown in a rented boat come by with a spreader bar and put your spool Puts down. Right oh, down. my God. Yeah. Drives you oh, nuts. Drive you flipping insane. And that's <laughs> the downside when they're 30 miles out. Yeah. You know, we have a rental boat fleet where you can join a club here and you get, you know, a little Key West Center console or a Defiance Pilot House. And the guy, t- they're not trying to be dicks. They just don't know better, you know. And man, that's frustrating, especially when you haven't been catching shit all day. They're finally floating, and now you got some clown following you around because you're in a big, nice boat. You must know where every fish in the ocean is, and oh, it'll drive you nuts. But it's the same challenge anywhere. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Satfish, satellite fishing technology. If you've been fishing for any length of time, especially offshore, you should understand how important preparedness is to a successful day on the water or multiple days on the water. Satfish combines the latest high definition satellite images and maps with advanced planning tools to make it easy to find the most productive offshore fishing grounds. Head straight to the bite zone instead of wasting time and fuel searching through lifeless water. You can visit satfish.com to check it out. Use the promo code SEARS22 for $20 off your first year and that includes a free 30-day trial. Give it a look if you're a canyon fisherman, sea surface temperatures, chlorophyll, uh, bathymetry, it's all on there. Great resource, um, great dashboard, easy to use, very intuitive. Check it out, satfish.com. What's your fleet size like on a Friday to Sunday primetime season out there typically? Inshore too. Like your inshore spot, that like 30 mile spot you were just mentioning. A lot. A lot. I don't even know because a lot of times there's, there's, there'll be different pockets of fish. So they're not like they're all on one bank. I think you guys are more throw the anchor down in one spot. You're playing bumper boats. We're spread out more, but I mean, there's plenty of days where you can see 60 boats around you, no problem. And there's probably another couple hundred that you can't see yeah. kind of thing. So it's very similar. Also have, yeah. Yeah. Amount probably. Boats. Yeah. Yeah. We also have the party boats, which God bless those guys. I mean, these idiots don't know what they're doing. So they're just sitting their chum line. I, I don't know how they do it without losing their minds, you know? Everybody follows. And and dude, if you're not a good fisherman, that's been the standard line here as long as time is go sit by a party boat. Oh, they must know where the fish are at, you know, and I try to teach that in seminars and stuff. It's like they don't know where all the fish are. They're fishing a different game than you are. The game is they have 10,000 scoops of live bait. You don't like sitting there poaching their chum line is not an effective strategy. You're better slipping off by yourself and long soaking some baits on the fringes of that stuff and let the fish find you. But man, guys just get, I'm sure you see the same thing. Don't know what they're doing. Get frazzled. Got clients on board. They aren't producing. And then they just do dumb shit. I get guys on my boat. Hey, why don't we just go sit in his... No, I'd rather catch no fish than do that. Right. You know? 
Yeah. I, I don't have time for that. No, we see we see uh, all of every it, everything, uh, including like <laughs> people following us out of the harbor in the morning. Yeah. Oh, dude, like we have all to, the, we, we gotta go lights out. Yes, yeah, so we have to shut nav, in August. Like, nav lights off everything in, in August. August and just go completely dark. That's sea white sea bass fishing for us. Yeah. We just sit there in the pitch dark, completely unsafe, anchored up on a beach somewhere, but you don't want anybody to know what you're doing, so you, you go dark. But I totally get it, man. I mean, we have times where we stop to take a leak, and we'll get swarmed by two of those little boats. I think we're stopped fighting fish. <laughs> we're just trying to piss. Get yeah. away. <laughs> you know, we filmed a swordfish uh... show here, me and Rush, on, on my boat, on my old boat, which was really well known, you know, <clears> plenty of tournaments and all that stuff, and and uh, we were sitting there drifting for freaking swords with giant hooker electric reels. And we've got people trolling right off our stern trying to catch a tuna. I'm like, well, how could you be so clueless? You know, yeah. if you really enjoy it, put the time in and get good at it. Spend a little time, read, you know, talk right. to people. But instant, that is not instant a gratification track. and expectations have completely changed since we all started as 100 percent, 100 percent. And the Instagram freaking heroes and all. I mean. I know you guys got all the same shit over there. It's just, man, I just want to go catch a fish and have a good time. Sh- share it with some people. I know. So kind of talk to us about the, I mean, Reader's Digest evolution of what you've been seeing over there the last decade as far as numbers of fish, um, like all the way down to like mm-hmm. what's your your day, a typical day look like? Like what's your bag you limits? Focus on bluefin? Yeah, just focus on your fish. Talk about bluefin? Yeah, exactly. Well, so bluefin fishing here, traditionally, bluefin have been a bonus. They were never like, we. you almost couldn't go target them. Like sometimes they're always mixed with the yellowfin or albacore. Um, and we would, bluefin would be total dicks. You couldn't hook them. You'd see them on the surface. And they're all small. We never see big ones in our close, close waters. A couple hundred miles down the beach, yeah, 150 pounders, even the occasional 200. But locally, they were all from 15 to 50 pounds, the bulk of them. You might get a 60 or an 80 pound standout. Um, They'd foam like crazy, which I think that's a term we use here more, but I know you guys know what that is. And you would sit there and throw everything you had in the boat at them, live bait, dead bait, lures. I mean, anything you can think of, and you might pick one off a day. And so there, there was this saying, oh, that's just bluefin being bluefin, right? There's just more show than go, yada, I, I'm, a million things that go with that. But then in 15, we had the El Nino, and that changed everything. Like I, I was saying, I mean, it's just like a fisherman's dream come true. All these species, we had big yellowfin around, 150-pound yellowfin. We never see that in our local waters. Um, we had all the the marlin, the wahoo, the spearfish. We caught a bunch of opa. We caught all kinds of crazy stuff. And what that whatever happened then, in my opinion, was so dramatic, it shifted our normal currents. And it, for whatever reason, put this uh, anchovy in our waters and tons and tons of anchovy and red crab really to kick it off. Um, and that changed everything. So we had 15 was an epic year catching all this crazy shit. It was the best thing ever. Towards the end of 2015, I had some buddies that were Cabo yacht captains and they moved the boats back and forth. And I was talking to one of them. He goes, dude, did you hear about this bluefin? I'm like, no, who cares? Whatever. Big deal. 20 pound bluefin. Like he goes, no, no big bluefin. And I'm like, where down the line? He's like, nope. And he told me it's a spot, the 43, which is just South of San Clemente Island out there. He goes, go out there run the Cabo program, put the kite up, skip a bait below it. And we used to always skip a dead bait that we bridled underneath the kite. And he goes, something cool is going to happen. And our boat had had a blown out transmission. So we're like, well, shit, we need to see this. So we recruit a buddy, had a nice 37 Riviera. We go buzzing out there and no, I mean, the, the general public had no clue this was going on. It was strictly an insider kind of thing. It's awesome. And we did not skip that stupid yummy for shit 10 minutes. Kaboom. <laughs> oh my That's God. I would have lost my mind. We did. I mean, we were screaming shit in our pants. I mean, the thing came tight <laughs> immediately. Right. And I tried to hand the rod off. Nobody wanted it because they didn't want to mess up this once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> so like went to the PV program, put the harness on, clipped it in, did all that stuff. That 140 pound fish did not know what hit him. Uh, he was to the back of the boat in like under 10 minutes. Guy stuck gas in his head, and my partner was with me, and we just looked at each other like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> I mean, like, speechless, yeah. you know? 
And it, and with me and him, that's only happened one other time, and that was hooking a swordfish on the surface, which is the rarest of rare of rare accomplishments out here, you know? And we're just like, the fish was dead, and we were still stunned. We had no idea. And I remember taking it to the scale to weigh it, and there was people coming out of buildings and all over the place, and I'm getting phone calls, and it broke the internet. We put it up on BD, and, like, nobody could believe it. Nobody. And we were fortunate to catch, I think, one or two more that season. It was right at the end of the season, like October. And then they went away. And then we're like, holy shit, are they coming back? Is this going to happen again? You know, a few other guys caught them that were good sticks, but we were really the first ones to talk about it. And it was on the cover of the Melton catalog. Like, that was kind of a big deal, you know? And and that started it all, man. 2016. So our tuna season here typically starts, if you were to say – you know, over the last 50 years, when does Southern California tuna season start? If you're really desperate and you want to go look hard, you could find them in June, but it really starts 4th of July. That's our, our window. Wow. So the next year in March, every local bank we have is covered in 80 to 150 pound fish, and they will eat anything that you threw into them. Wow. I mean, it was nuts. Popper fishing was just went crazy. Guys are trying to show, throw poppers on their surface iron rods, and it's not working real well. Enter the, the spinning phase here where guys figured out, hey, it's probably better to throw a popper with a spinning reel <laughs> yeah. than it is a, a, a jig rod. I mean, we caught a lot of them on surface iron, too. Don't get me wrong. And, and that's a whole nother controversy that we can talk about. But, like, spinning rod's better to hook one. Jig rod is better to fight one. Right. No question in my mind. I, right. I'm very open-minded to both of them. But, dude, if I hook a 200-pounder on a spinning rod, I am either cutting that fish off or I'm handing it. <laughs> Same. I don't I don't. Nothing to do with that. <laughs> nothing to do it could go hook we, we hooked a 280 pound yellow fin on a spinning rod one time six hours and six guys later we killed it Holy it was shit. the most miserable experience <laughs> of my adult life <laughs> dude i don't know how those other guys do it you see sammy and all those asian guys and all that stuff and they're just putting the wood to them I, not for me also, anyway give me a rail rod there's guys jigging them on spinning rods down in obx catching right now, release yeah. and doing like 400 pounders 400 100 inches i'm like no thank you what is wrong with you <laughs> that's all i want to know no jigging them you know on a conventional into that like honestly i don't even pull on them anymore i'd rather just have somebody else do it so i can scream at them it's a lot more fun for me right probably less for them but <laughs> you know I, uh, I just enjoy the bite and I, I'm sure you guys are the same way. Like, and all of our bites are surface bites, or I'd say 80% of them are. So we see them blown out on those kite baits and stuff. It's the best thing ever. But I mean, that, that progressed that year was, was anomalous in the last five years, more so they've been showing up small ones in April, May really don't start to get with it until June, you know, and we catch it. We pick off one here and pick off one there and we'll, you know, be fishing 30 pounders, like last year, we had a, a couple of days we're down there fishing 30, 40, 50 pounders, and we hooked a couple of, you know, 180s on 40 pound. And, oh, talking about miserable. It's yeah. no wow. fun either. Ugh. But uh, it really gets going in June now. And then from June until Thanksgiving, man, it's almost six months of just game on. They'll go on. We, You know, I call it the walkabout. They'll disappear sometimes for a week and a half or two weeks or sometimes three weeks. We just can't find them. And they go, I think, up to the Channel Islands and way offshore but they seem like they always end up spinning back in. But for the most part, I mean, shoot from mid June through November, we have, uh, it's pretty rare to strike out or not have some legit chances, you know, pretty much exactly aligned with us. Yeah. Other than the very early part of the season, 4th of July is when we're, you know, we're going like this, like, here we go, baby, you know? Okay. uh, But you get them in June. We've had them as early as mid May, but um, you know, commercial for us doesn't start till June. And then, July is really when you start seeing the 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 pressure of boats on them. Um, really? Okay. Yeah. And does that affect them a lot? It does. Like, thousand you're percent. you're so shallow, I'd have to think it's the totally. impact of the boats is way worse. It seems like our fish forget pretty quick. You know what I mean? Like I was telling you when they bite in the afternoon, you got idiots running over them all day, bouncing shit off their heads, doing all that stuff. But once the evening comes, they kind of settle in and they want to bite when they're you know, like, op- see- when they're like open water down here, like Chatham, you know, great South channel and the canyons, We're out you, east. you can run them over quite a bit and they'll okay. still bite. And it's usually tide related, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're North of the Cape in the Bay, Mass Bay, Cape Cod Bay, Ipswich Bay, you put a shit load of lines in the water and they act completely different. They will, the bigger fish will generally 
still bite with a whole bunch of anchors and lines in the water. You just have to trick them. But that like, you know, school size fish to like 90, 95 inches aren't as comfortable in the gear as those big PEI, you know, big herring feeder fish are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I so, could see that. I mean, some of our biggest fish that we've hooked have been in mat. I mean, fleets of, a, you know, a hundred boats. Everybody's oh, within a, a half a half a mile, quarter mile of each other. Qu- every quarter mile down the edge, an anchor ball, and then you're hooking up with three lines, fifty oh. pounder. <laughs> yeah. What? A, yeah. So we're drifting close, like especially when you're on the we call it on the meat, right? You got them just parading underneath the boat. I'll call in everybody I have. Come up, swell me, sit on top of me, wow. put your bait. Um, I, I don't even care. We want to get everybody congregated and everybody getting bit. Um, but we don't really have problems with, we don't have anchors down. So we don't ever saw each other off. Very rare to wrap somebody up or any of that stuff. I got to say, I'll, I'll definitely take it our way versus yours. And yeah. Fortunately, our fish aren't 900 pounds. Like they're not going to sound a, a pen 50 or a pen 30 of line. So like the depth isn't really an issue. And bluefin don't, like yellowfin a lot of times will squirt across, across the surface and rip off 700 yards bluefin just aren't going to do that they might rip off 150 or 200 but they're typically running down and out when they yeah, do yeah, you're lucky. So, <laughs> it, it, yeah yeah i know we make it work but you're going to catch those giants at 100 feet of water so there's definitely a trade-off there yeah. too yeah our know? fish playing way out i mean a lot of these bigger fish are on the surface like a blue marlin half the time mm. like you've seen yeah, in our bigger yeah. fish yeah i get one that stays up top i know it's over 250 yeah like i just i know it is they'll just they, for whatever reason yellowfin will do the same thing the bigger ones like the surface huh it seems, you know, no, that's crazy how many similarities there are. I've talked to guys, you know, anecdotally here and there about your fishery versus ours. And, you know, we went up there and fish with uh, Tyler, Cynthia C and all yeah, that. Yeah. And, but you guys are, uh, you're fit. He's a lot more of a spear boat guy or a stick boat guy. You guys are more rod and reel guys. It's yeah. interesting to hear how similar all that stuff was. And one of the things that I wanted to pick off from you guys was that whole trolling game. Like, you know, the 16 spreader bars and all that shit and the Islanders back there and all that. I know it'll work here just fine. And spreader bars have really caught on in the last couple, three years. But um, that was something we talked about from day one. A guy I fish with all the time, Brett, he's from New York. So he, you know, he knows all the same tactics and tricks you guys do. He was always a mate back there. He knows that fishery really well. And we just talked about it. I mean, we're kind of lazy. Like, I don't just don't want to set an outrigger yeah. with yeah. two clips and all of that what, stuff what, when I can just drop what's hilarious what's actually interesting is uh the difference going from like the canyons up to where we're actually fishing um, oh really you know like as far as spreads like we're we're fishing a max of five rods for giants up by us okay so it's to- trolling it's, trolling. Trolling. it's yeah. totally trolling, uh yeah. you know when we go to the canyons we're fishing that you know six to some boats 12 rods um but you know, more often than not, we're only fishing four or five rods with, with big spreader bars, trolling slower. Everything's really spaced out, you know, natural looking. We're not using a, a ton of extra birds and commotion, um, which is something that, I mean, I don't know if you guys have tried it by you for those big, big fish. Um, you know, kind of like how you're fishing the, the, the flying fish. You guys are going really slow with the dead ones, right? You're basically sitting still. We're either drifting right. or we're walking typically. But when we were skipping the yummy, that was an eight to nine knot game. Wow. And we're still doing it. It's just not as popular. Um, the dead flyer is way more effective. But if you need to cover ground and you can't find the fish, you want the yummy out. And a lot of times you just get a free bite. You know, you have a 200 pounder, mm-hmm. come up and smash it. But the first, and, and that's how our fishery has changed. The first two seasons, it was poppers, then yummies. No dead flyers, no nothing. And then about the third season of it, somebody's like, hey, you know, back in the day, they used to catch them on dead flying fish. Let's see if it works. <laughs> and, dude, the dead flying fish are like crack. They just can't say no. I, I really I tell people this all the time. I think that fish is genetically programmed through thousands of years of evolution. Mm-hmm. When I see they a flying fish, it. I smash it. They right. just they don't even have to be hungry. You know, the, bite, get bites. the bites you guys are getting on fish dude, oh, with those ridiculous. dead flying fish. Taylor and I are like. <laughs> I've, we want to try it here, honestly. Oh, yeah. It is unbelievable the bites are getting on film. It will. I guarantee you 1,000% it'll work. We don't even have to use real flyers. We can use that California flyer, which works incredibly well. And I don't have to touch those stinky effing flying fish. They are yeah. nasty. It's a winged mullet, dude. They're gross. And uh, 
it, it'll totally work. I promise you. The other thing that we're doing from a stationary boat when we're fishing either the immortal or a dead bait is we use an electric kite reel. You guys probably do too. So we walk it out with the kite reel and then we retrieve it. So got if it. I'm drifting, a lot of times I got the fish under me. I don't want to move or I've got two fish hanging. You know, I'm walking it out with the kite and I'm walking it back and I'll wow. walk that thing out till like I'm half a school out, 300 yards. And then I walk it back in and it's just like any predator. The movement triggers a bite. You know, I, I know you guys do some hunting and out here in the West, we do a lot of glassing and I attribute it to a deer moving his ear. I will glass that same mountainside for three hours straight, not see anything. And then I see a little ear flick and I'm like, oh, well, there he is. Yeah. yeah. And, and just getting that bait, walking away from the boat and coming back, they'll find it. Don't get me wrong. You can dead boat it. And just, and there's times like we're bit and shit's going crazy. And I just leave one laying on the surface. And next thing you know, you hear a drag scream, but that little bit of movement helps them find it so much faster. And I mean, who doesn't want to see it running away from them when they try to smash yeah, it? It's, just, cool. eh. it's awesome. We'll hold that bait and we'll let the kite <laughs> clip get, you know, a hundred yards off the side of the boat. And then I'll put my hand on the reel while the kite's still going out build pressure and let it go so it's like a slingshot huh. and it just goes chick, 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 across the water trying to catch up to the clip and then you see a 250 come out and blow it in. oh dude that's sick it's so sick and when the first guy misses it there's usually another one right behind him so sometimes like especially with the yummy when you're moving fast you'll get them on each other's backs climbing on each other trying to get onto that bait sometimes you'll see them 10 feet out of the water with that bait hanging out of the corner i mean just the sickest shit ever. It's, awesome. it's so rad so awesome. hooking them and winding them in yeah whatever i just want to get bit huh i don't know we should experiment in the bay we don't get flyers in the bay but it's doesn't like they, they eat them it, yeah 40 it miles should just away. be a reaction but you'd think you know doesn't matter you don't get tacos in tokyo you put one in front of me <laughs> in japan and i'm gonna smash it <laughs> very you good point I mean? very like, good point does not matter i i really believe that i yeah. don't think it matters at all hmm that's cool. Have you have you done any? I'm sure you have other dead baits on the kite that you've had success with dead squids or, or anything squid. weird like that. Yeah, we've caught a few on squid. In fact, um, when we go fishing in Puerto Vallarta, it, bait making can be a challenge for sure. And I was down there catching yellowfin, and I'm like, you know what? Why wouldn't they eat a giant squid dangling under the kite? And I took a so I had guaranteed bait. I took like twenty, you know, like two pound squids, maybe sixteen inches hung those things on the kite and dude they could not get those things down their gullet fast and these are i mean good maybe like 24 inch even squids yeah. and i just let them chew on it for a minute and set them up and they ate it like crazy we just don't mess with it here because we know the dead flyers work you know and sometimes when they get real close to the island they'll go crazy on mackerel and they'll push the mackerel up against the edges of the kelp in 100 feet of water and they go into a mackerel mode up there shallow so we'll do a double trouble mackerel rig and we'll put that out on the kite and we've had success with that but I mean, you know, if I caught 60 or 70 big ones last year, sheesh, I mean, I, I, I'd say 80% of them, 90% of them were either on the immortal or a dead bait. Mm. Oh, and when we can get live flyers, oh my God. Oh, I'm sure that's just it's, absurd. It's absurd. The guys with the yachts can go stay at the islands overnight and then they'll just turn the lights on or they'll pull the anchor and they'll walk, work up and down the beach and they'll net them one at a time and put them in their live well. But for a center console guy, that's not really an option. But the guy who actually catches them to sell, he'll be out at the island a lot, and they'll let you know on Instagram, hey, we're going to be here this weekend. And you can put in an order, and you go roll up, and he'll give you this. It's a five-gallon bucket that's got tubes in it that you hook up to your washdown hose, hmm. and you can put about eight live ones in there. And when you've got meter marks and you feed one of those back, it's not will it get bit. When will it get bit? It's hmm. just they go stupid, stupid on them. Hmm. And a lot of the guys that I know that are real you know, heavy hitter guys, they'll only fish the live flyer anymore. Have you tried, uh, I don't know if you guys have a different name for it. Have you ever tried a stick bait flyer down deep? Do you know, uh, I don't know if you know what a stick bait is or. I mean, like a stick bait, like you cast. No, no, no. no. We, we call. This would be something cool. It's a to dead, try. dead bait rig. Basically we take a, de for us, it's like a dead herring or dead mackerel. Okay. Uh, we take a couple of shish kebab skewers and skewer down the backbone. Add, Sim similar okay. to how you guys do with the flyer. Add lead to his mouth. And actually, okay. that's a that's a deep bait. We'll actually put that down. You know, we're fishing 120 feet. We'll go down 70, 80 feet on the down line. We bait. do that same thing all the time, but we use live bait because we have it. Got it. Interesting. Interesting. Have you tried yeah, it with I a big flyer, like with the wings uh, out and everything? Because I know guys do it in the canyons here and crush the elephant doing it. Yeah. 
I have not tried that. I know they'll eat it. There's not a doubt in my mind. We will put squid down there, dead squid sometimes. And then we'll also put uh, live mackerel. Hmm. Like if I, if I know that I'm on the meat, especially when they're on the structure, like if they're on the corner of the Tanner bank or something like that, I'm trying to drift all day. It's just way more fun. Yeah. And even if I get an hour low where I don't get any bites or see anything, I'm going to probably stick with it. And my typical rig, I'll put the kite out. Sometimes if I know I'm going to be drifting a bunch, I'll put a second kite out. And then we do a couple of down baits. One might be a sardine, um, you know, with a rubber banded sinker. And then we might do a piece of squid or something else on the other one. And then we also, we do what we call backpack rigging, where we take a piece of that black pipe foam, like you'd insulate your water heater with. Yep. And we trim it to match the taper of their back. And then we stitch it onto them. We put their wings out. And then I'll take like an Ada Mustad circle. And then we'll wire it to the top of their head. And then we just let it drift off the upwind side of the boat. So now oh, we got wow. two two back two backpacks out, two down rigs, two kite baits, and that's sort of very similar to like our our uh, Puerto Vallarta program too. We'll have a couple cabido fly line, a couple baits down, and a couple baits on the kite. And I just feel like for tuna fishing, there's not if especially if you're drifting, there's not a better way to present. You know what I mean? And sometimes you're just sitting there watching because you're always watching the kite, but the backpack rig that's a free fish. You just hear the clicker start screaming. You pick it up, and there's a 180 pounder there waiting for you. It's pretty awesome, dude. That backpack are you, are you rig having... would crush at night in the canyons, like far, oh, far oh, floater, yeah. backpack flying yep. fish, just like way, way, way the fuck out, like yep. whole top shot. Take a piece of yellow pool noodle and you put it like kind of where your leader is, about 30 feet where your leader meets the braid, at least for us. So you've got an indicator because he's hard to see on the surface. You got a green little piece of foam, and then just strip them off. You know, I put one like at 60 yards and one at 100 yards it's deadly it's totally dead and most guys don't do it here they don't bother now there there's a couple of baits that guys have come out with that float and the california flyer guys are working on one as well if i can do that with artificials as i slide into a school i'll have two rods rigged up every single time where i can just throw them into the prop wash as the boat's sliding so now they're already 75 yards away put one on the bow put one on the stern and then go put my kite out it's just it's just another way to to get a bite that you know really low impact low brain damage kind of thing talk to us a little bit about bait is it you know for for us we really only have you know for tuna bluefin specifically like four or five different types of bait uh and and only half of those are actually easy to catch um yes it sounds like you have a ton of options well we probably do, but because we have the live bait fishery we have, I'm sure you guys have seen what our bait docks look like. Yeah, we Like have. I pull up and I take, you know, we call it scoops, but, you know, four or five scoops of sardine that allow me to chum with these little – everybody who comes from anywhere in the world and sees our bait, they just lose their minds. You know, we have special built bait tanks in the cockpit of our boats just to hold them because they're not as hardy as a mackerel or a – you know, a caballito or a goggle eye or, you know, whatever those, those baits down in Florida, you can put them in a bucket and they'll be fine. So we are the only true live bait fishery where you don't have to make the bait. And that is the, it's literally the bloodline of our sport boat fishery. You know, I'd say 85, 90% of the fishing that happens on this coast happens on a sport boat. So we're the minority being the private boat guys and the small boat charter fleet, but that live bait just makes shit happen for, you know, you get a, our, our old way of fishing where we, you know, our typical fishing was catching 20 to 60 pound bluefin, yellowfin, albacore. We would troll feather jigs. We would get a jig strike or multiple jig strikes. You throw a scoop of bait in the water and then you bring the unbit jigs and the hooked fish back as fast as you can. The bait's going to try and hide underneath the boat. And then you shut the boat down and fill the boat. That's our normal program. And it 100% relies on sardines. You know, these are six to nine inch sardines. We're so lucky to have them. But all the, the party boat guys are typically catching most of their tuna on the sardine, and they have one or two kites or balloon rigs going off the boat, and they do that in a rotation with a flying fish or whatever. On our boat, most of our fish come on the big bait just because we can fish the big bait mm. effectively with you know better better anglers and better um, you know mobility and not so many rods and mouths to feed kind of thing. Huh. But for us, it's sardine and mackerel. The, yeah. the vast majority of it's sardine and mackerel for for bluefin but like i said i could i probably caught over 100 pounds last year a handful on sardine and a handful on mackerel not very many at all i got one guy I fish with a lot he loves a lot feed him a live bait just to feel the bite or whatever and if it wasn't for him i'd probably have none i just i know that flying fish works 
or some, you know, form of the flying fish dead live, whatever, skip them yummy. And that's just, it weeds out all the small fish, you know, there's, there's a bunch of benefits to it in my mind. What's the specialty rig in the live well that you were saying for the anchovies? Uh, so our live sorry, wells Dean, sorry. are, are, they have what we call, well, their anchovy is, we do get anchovy in the bait receivers at times. And some years it's only anchovy, but we've been fortunate for the last, 12 or 15 years to have the sardines which are easier to cast easier to fish they swim better a million benefits but we our live wells they're like a big oval i'm sure you've seen them on the decks of our boats and they've got a baffle in one side and what that baffle does on one side of the baffle it's actually split is the drain side so it gently pulls all the water from the top and the bottom of the water column and it pulls it into the drain really slow and what that does on the other side of the baffle the baffle you got an oval like this, the baffle's kind of like that, exaggerated, but it's kind of a triangle. It sticks out a little bit. This side's pushing water into your tank counterclockwise, huh. yeah, and this side is out. sucking it out gently. And what this side does, it also pulls out all the poop off the bottom of the tank, which gets stirred up and it chokes them out, and it gives you an even, consistent flow. And like when we're setting up a new boat, we're looking for like a seven to nine minute fill rate. So we literally stopwatch, okay, it took four minutes to fill, give it a little more water stopwatch okay nine minutes okay cut it down a little bit and then that okay now we've got the right flow rate and the smaller bait you want a seven minute fill on mackerel you want a nine minute fill sardine somewhere in between Hmm. and it's this this counterclockwise rotation we put sardines in these tanks in the morning and they come out looking better in the afternoon when we we throw out whatever we haven't used it's just there's no bait system like it that i've ever really seen you've seen some of the florida guys have gone to a similar setup for their tournament sail fishing rigs where they put those live wells on the deck um but we have to and we like if we do multi-day trips here where we go down and say we go to cabo we carry that bait all the way with us i mean it just gets stronger and stronger to the point where we feed it you know we're putting bonita flakes in there we're feeding them cornmeal we're feeding them oatmeal whatever and getting those baits we call that cured once all the dead stuff is died off and only the strong survive that's the best bait there is and the long range boats have got their own row of bait boxes that it's all cured for them so they're taking the hardiest best possible bait with them you know a thousand miles down the beach that's so cool and so different dude that's we're catching i mean our baits like it's you know you've been a pei so it's an easy comparison but we're catching our bait every morning right there you're literally on the anchor on the anchor Full live wall of mackerel, full live wall of herring, depending on the time. Put them out. That, Rush does the it. same thing with the cast net or the sabikis every single day. We, you know, sometimes fishing with Rush, it takes us three hours to find the bait and get it in the boat. So, like, it's such a huge time saver here. And just we're blessed with that bait. Hmm. Blessed with it. Like, there's nowhere else in the world where you can pull up and buy as much bait as you want. Christmas morning, 10 a.m., they will fill your tank. It's awesome. Like they're there 24 7, 365. If they don't come out, you honk the horn, they'll come out, they'll scoop you up. We are very, very grateful. It's called Everingham Brothers, are the guys that um, own the bait concession here. And they go out and they sane it on the coast, they wrap it up. And that's one of the things that the Enviros are always trying to shut down. But it would literally kill our entire sport fishing fleet if we didn't have that live bait. You guys did a great job highlighting that in one of your episodes. I remember watching it was like legitimately more than half the episode was focused on those guys. It was it was cool. So like the floating docks and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yep. that one. Yeah. 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 We did a piece <laughs> for Grundens too where we highlighted That's, this kid that yep. runs the bait docks and it just really told the story and guys loved it because they finally understood like what what we mean when we say we've got, you know, that live bait on tap. Yeah. You were just like an encyclopedia of. Well, he's he's a nerd just like us. Yeah, that's, totally. That's the problem here. <laughs> Straight up geek, guys. Like, if I'm not doing it, I'm reading about it. I'm talking 100%. to people. And that's been the best part about doing local knowledge is I get to fish with all of these legends and all these rad places and learn from them and become friends with them. And you know, obviously, you guys are very good in your backyard, but I got a few tricks I'm sure I could teach you, and vice versa. Where most guys fish in a bubble their whole life, you know, especially if you're not as serious about it as we are. You kind of do it the way your uncle did it or the way your dad did it. And odds are your uncle and dad were probably shitty fishermen. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) And and the tons change. So much has changed. Yeah, it's like constantly innovating. We tuna at the 302 in June. I'm like, are you fucking stupid? They move around a lot. Be smarter than just going to the same spot in an open ocean at a certain time. Like, dude, be smarter than that. Be a student of the game. If you're going to yeah. do it, be good at it. Taylor and you I know? were, Taylor and I were probably early teens, 12, 13 years old. Sears game fisherman, little small outboard 
in the river. I remember having this conversation with you. How sick would it be if bluefin tunas came into the river and we, you know, we hooked them here and right in our backyard? Sure as shit. Two years ago, 18 feet of water, mouth of the river, pogey school, like you saw with uh, on Cynthia C there. Legit airing out, blowing up, hooking, couldn't, couldn't hooking them in the mouth of the river. It was surreal. Oh, it's so sick. That's the stuff, man, that just, I mean, that's magic, right? You've been dreaming about it. I mean, dude, when I started fishing Puerto Vallarta, that's, Puerto Vallarta changed my life. I went down there. It was, They were at the best cycle they'd ever known, and it went away like all cycles do, but it changed my life. I went down there in 2003, I think it was, and I caught my first cow tuna on my first day fishing, 241 pound yellowfin. And I saw shit that you couldn't dream about. You know what I mean? I'm like, well, this is what I do now. Like <laughs> all I want to do is chase big tuna. Yeah. It's all. And ever since that spark, it's all, I did it, you know, rode around with other guys and learned from them. And then eventually I got my own boat and, you know, I'd already been fishing here for years on private boats and catching little albacore and stuff like that. If I never see an albacore again, it'd be too soon. Yeah. Like, give me the yellow fin, give me the blue fin. That's all I care about. But no, and then, oh, you know what? By the way, there's 200 pounders 30 miles off your dock. Are you effing kidding me? Yeah. It's just, it's been unreal. I love to do that rock fishing stuff. And last year, my photo of the year, like when I think about last year's season, we had them closer than we've ever had them before. And I was on one of my rock fishing spots at these islands, the Coronado Islands, like 15 miles offshore. I'm like a, a mile offshore of the island, and I see a foamer. My buddy's like, oh, look, a foamer. I'm like, it's just dolphin feeding. Chill out. But we hadn't dropped yet, so I'm like, they're from South Dakota. I go, let's go check it out. So I roll out there so they can just see all the life. It's dolphins and sea lions and all this shit, just massive ball, foaming, going crazy. My buddy's like, give me a rod, give me a rod. I'm like, chill out. It's just dolphin. I look up, and they're 150s. <laughs> sick sky and i'm like what the f they, these guys never mix together they never do that throw an iron instantly bit these guys put bait in the water instantly bit we go oh for five i'm like they just pulled hooks like nothing i can do about that yeah. i can live with pulled hooks so we go and catch our fish, bottom fish and we fill the box i mean we had a great day like i had like six guys on there's like 60 rock fish right awesome day nice big ones everybody's on the way on the way back like hey can we go look for those two and i'm like of course get up in the tower and i go Right from there, we got this whole bank, the nine mile bank. I cruise the whole bank looking for them. I don't see shit. I'm like, sorry guys, it's just you know they're down. It's a tide, whatever. It's not going to happen. I bend the boat towards the marina, and I get like three and a half miles off the marina, and there's foamers everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And we roll in there, and we hook an eighty and a one ten in like thirty minutes. So I got a box full of cod with two bluefin laying on top of it that were incidental catches. You could see the people on the beach, like Wild. just what's next. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And don't get me started on swordfish. Like that's a whole nother fishery here that's developed in the last three or four years where it was impossible to catch a swordfish and we're doing it right and left. It's just, it's sick what's going on here right now. That's so cool. You have a question? No, I mean, I have a comment. Swordfish we could go into. I actually just watched, uh, I think it was on YouTube one of your, one of your, uh, uh, sessions it was like you rush and one other guy talking about swordfish and comparing notes from florida to the west coast oh, yeah that was actually interesting to listen to um, cool i'm glad but, you well we could go it. i mean that could be a, so we'll have to table swordfish it's, it's this is just bad um <clears throat> do you want to get into uh a little bit about bd outdoors B, yeah local we, we got it we could again that's another five-hour conversation but we'd love to hear more about how local knowledge start how did you how did it evolve? That's a crazy story. So um, I never, I never had like a fishing show, like a dream as a kid, right? We all wanted to be Roland Martin. Like that was my guy growing up. Roland Martin, Orlando Wilson, Jimmy Houston. Me Jimmy and my brother Houston would lay, yeah. lay on the floor, you know, of the, uh, of the living room on our stomachs and just watch that stuff for hours and hours. But it was just never something I thought was realistic or wanted to do. It just sort of happened in a strange way. Um, I know you guys know who Jose Wehebe is, mm -hmm. right? Spanish fly. So he was a good friend of mine. He, one of his best friends is my artist that worked for me for years and years. And we've been friends and worked together for 20 years. So I met Jose through him and we became good friends. And all of us just kind of hung out and and, uh, and spent time together at the boat shows and all that. And then Jose passed away. And he crashed his airplane and he died in a fireball, you know, and that whole thing, which was a huge bummer and shock to the industry. But Jose had a right-hand man and his name was Mikey. 
And Mikey worked at Jose's house with him. Is Mike Torbisco. We call, everybody calls him Mikey. That's what Jose always called him. And Mikey was kind of like looking for something to do after Jose passed, and he really didn't know what to do. And we had a project with the state of Louisiana at that time. This was after the BP spill, where we were helping them build a Come Fish Louisiana website. We were all the species, all the techniques. It was this huge, huge project that engulfed us for several years while Jose was going to do the video component. And when Jose went, we, Mikey was like, I think I can handle it. You know, let me do it. And we and I knew Mikey a little bit, but not very well. And always thought well of him when I dealt with him. He was a smart kid, you know, fresh out of college kind of guy, video, um, what, what's the, the degree, whatever, video production degree, I guess you would say. And just a sharp kid. And and so when this when Jose passed, Mikey was kind of in shell shock for a bit. And I told him to come up to ICAST in July. Jose passed, I think, in February or March. Come up to, to ICAST in July and let's meet. So we met. He's our kind of guy, likes to joke, have a good time. We are not serious about anything at all, ever. We like to screw around and... <laughs> Your mom's not safe. Your sister, your kids. That's how we roll, too. Same. Oh, it's horrifying. If anybody ever heard the way we talk, I swear to God, I I wouldn't have a sponsor. But anyway, we just, you got to have a thick skin to hang out with us, right? Or because if you don't, we will find your weakness and we will exploit it till you cry. (laughs) And it happens. Um, So anyway, we like Mikey, right? And then after that, I'm like, hey, dude, we're going to PEI. And we went last year. This is our second trip up there. We gave away a trip. You want to come up and produce a video for us? And we agreed on a number and all that. He was all into traveling and seeing it. So we brought him up there, and he starts filming. The first thing we learn is he's a seasick mother. He's puking his gods up. But he can puke and rally, which I respect. But right, You can't control the seasick, but if you can puke and rally, I'm okay with that. So we gave him a bunch of shit for puking and, you know, rode him, and he took it all day long, and he had some funny jokes, and and we enjoyed having him around. And then – about a month later, he sends me a draft of the video, and I'm just like, it, it blew me away. It totally blew my mind. The quality of the production was better than Wicked Tuna. The detail, all I remember, the things I remember are like the anchor line going out and the water dripping off the hands of the guy and the, you know, the slow-mo of the bait coming up. All that detail stuff that you see all over our show that nobody else used to do when our show came out, and everything was really cinematic. He used a, a a very different camera where most guys were using a TV camera that looks and feels like you're watching a news reporter on a fishing show. He was using a DSLR. He shot it all on a 5D, which you could use those Canon lenses and give you that big cinematic feel that every show is using today. Again, I feel like we totally pioneered that in our space. Hundred percent, right? In order to make that work, he had we call it the bat belt. It was like this <laughs> gear belt. He's such a dork too. And we, trust me, we've he heard about it every 10 seconds, but <laughs> a belt that was just laden and shit with cables coming off of it. Right. Stuff that I have no idea what's going on. He's got some M&Ms in a side pouch, <laughs> you know, over here. He's got his leather. I'm, I'm picturing the shit. mini M&M tubes right now. Like, oh, oh, dude, like, serious. A little. <laughs> he's got his Leatherman so he can shank you with that little blade. <laughs> if you get out of line and, or, you know, uh, pop a oyster for you later on all this bullshit in order to make it work and we were laughing at him i saw the product and i told him i go dude i am more proud of this video than anything my company has produced in a decade literally it was the most amazing thing we ever put out and we put it out and people went crazy for it because it just told the story right all fishing shows videos all that shit traditionally has been about beating your chest and showing you what a great fisherman i am who gives a shit yep. once you've done this a while you realize fish are pretty stupid. Catching them is not that hard. If you think you're a big deal because you catch fish, you're a moron. You know what I mean? Like, be a good father. Be a good person. There's a million other things that are more important than fishing. But for him to be able to capture the storytelling with the details and the passion that we all share, like, you have something wrong with you to get out of bed at 4 o'clock every morning for six months straight, right? And he just he captured it all. And the fish was like the bonus. Mm-hmm. And when we put this out, we're like, oh, shit, we're on to something. Everybody loved it. Sponsors loved it, everything. Hey, a couple of people recruited us to produce videos because I was already selling advertising to every fishing brand that there was, basically. And so we started doing video production. And then we start doing like Seagar. They wanted some videos showing how to rig stuff and tie knots. And Mikey's like, you want to try doing it? And I'm like, yeah, I'll give it a shot, whatever. And so I did it. And he goes, dude, 
I don't want to blow your head up at all because we don't get credit. To, it's always you talk shit to their face and you compliment them behind their back. <laughs> standard policy you do not get a compliment on any any time you're ever around us you are worse today than you ever were in your life as far as we're that's concerned. how our father is with us on the boat still <laughs> totally and we love each other and if it was any other way it would feel weird yeah. you know what i mean but like i'm like i just we were blown away and so we start producing a few i just did a couple of how to's he goes i don't want to tell you this but you're really good on camera and i'm like you're blowing smoke up my ass da, da, da. i and I wasn't nervous. I've never been nervous with public speaking and all that stuff. I used to do a bunch. Of, I used to work in video games. And I'd have to speak to rooms of like 60, 70 people at a time. And at first it was weird. And then kind of like if you know the subject matter, it's not really that scary. You're talking about something you understand. Mm -hmm. And I know knots. I know fishing. I geek out on that stuff. And so I, would, I was very good at that, I guess. And so I started putting out more videos. And it wasn't just him. And people were starting, hey, man, you're really good on camera. Da, 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 da. And so him and my artist, who were Jose's obviously much closer to Jose than I ever was. I'm like, we need to do a fishing show. I'm like, hell no, no way. Not on our brand. Not something I want to do. That's for, you know, guys with big egos and all that stuff that look good on camera. I'm a, you know, fat guy with a beard. I don't need any of that stuff. <laughs> and somehow or another, we keep putting out these videos, putting them out. I'm having fun doing them. People are like, dude, you taught me so much. I love it. And, and it was like, it's a great way to give back. Right. Cause I've got this, yeah. Like you guys charter, that's a pretty standard mold to get into fishing. You know, your dad ran charters, all that. I got this weird ass path, number one, to being in the fishing industry. We started BD because me and my buddy just were nerds and we wanted to show fishing information for where the albacore were. And now suddenly I get to do this for a living, which I feel like I'm 10 times more grateful than somebody who's a bitter old charter dude who kind of hates life but goes and does it anyway because it's all they know. And it was a way to give back. People were digging it. I'm getting good feedback. I feel like I'm doing something for my sport uh, you know or whatever my my area i don't know and so finally they beat me into submission and, and they'll tell you the same thing i was like i did not want to do this and i'm like okay let's try it and i go i of course i had so many good partners like afco trusts us costa trusts us um a bunch of these other guys i go i'm gonna put out a pilot i'm gonna show it to you and let us know if you like it and in it we were looking for an angle and originally we liked duck dynasty a lot. Like how it was like, not the, it was the business of duck hunting, not actually duck hunting. We're telling their telling stories. You're seeing behind the scenes people and all that people. And somewhere while we were trying to come up with a concept, uh, rush invited us back to the keys. We were there for my, Oh no, this wasn't my birthday trip. We we're just there prior to that for something. No, it was my birthday trip on my 40th birthday. We went out there, rush invited us fishing. And I got on Rush's boat, and I'm like, man, this guy has shit together. I mean, like, everything's dialed. All of his rods match, not for the sake of looking pretty, but so he knew exactly what he had at hand. All reels were rigged the same way. All of his gear was very well organized. and It was unlike any other charter I'd really ever been on, you know? And I was impressed. And then he took us out fishing, and it was all new to us, and we caught all kinds of cool shit. I mean, we caught kingfishes and groupers and yellowtail and, you know, mutton snappers, which is still one of my favorite fish and all this rad shit. And I'm like, God, this guy's got his shit together. And then somewhere along the line, Mikey's like, dude, what if we did an East Coast, West Coast show? Nobody's ever done that. And I'm like, that's not a bad idea. And I'm like, I talk to tackle companies all the time and I'm their solution for the West Coast. They think of us as only West Coast. And nowadays it's 50% of our traffic. We're global, right? To this day, oh, you're a West Coast guy. No, damn it, I'm not. You know, we got people, I can show you the the Google Analytics all over the place. But I'm like, I start shopping it around to kind of some friends in the industry who would become sponsors, you know? And they're like, man, if we could hit both coasts, that would be killer. And if we had somebody who was, you know, I hate to even say it, considered legitimate on both coasts who was talking to you, that would really be cool. And then we sort of started to hash it out. And then we're like, okay, well, let's have Rush come out here. We'll inv I'll invest. I think I spent 20 Gs or something out of my own pocket, a lot of money at the time. And let's see what we can do. So we put together a pilot where I brought him out here and we went and fished early season yellowtail. And I showed him how to throw surface iron on a long rod, which went horribly bad. He blew up reels. <laughs> <laughs> he was humble about it, you know, but yeah. he ended up getting one on his spinning rig at the end. I'm, he's like, are they line shy? I'm like, typically not at all. So of course he does the kook move, goes down to like 20 pound and a tiny hook. And hooks one right in front of me, the son of a bitch. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> saves the day, right? And then we went back and we filmed on his side with me learning about his fishery. And it was both, it was really natural. Rush is a geek. He knows his fishery inside and out. But he pays attention outside of there. 
And I've had the benefit of being able to travel a bunch and fish where he only fished in his waters. I'm like, why didn't you guys travel? He goes, it was so good here. We had no reason to, you know, they were smashing records every day and Key West was untapped. Mm-hmm. And now he's a salty old, oh, it's not what I used to be. These goddamn kids are shooting all the, uh, you know what I mean? And we're like falling into that old mold. But, um, he like, all he wanted to do was catch a big tuna. And I can do that. Like I can make yeah. that happen. Right. And I wanted to learn more about Florida fishing in the best spot. You know, I fished all over Florida. You can't argue Key West has the best fishing in Florida. And I got to learn about it from a guy who grew up there his whole life. And this was all that he knows. Like we know Calico Bass and Yellowtail and all that. And we just hit it off. And, and fortunately, Rush doesn't mind being made fun of and, you know, horrible <laughs> jokes and likes to have a good time. And we drink a few beers every now and again. And same kind of attitude, you know, very mellow dude who, who likes to laugh and doesn't take himself too seriously. You guys have and, a similar uh, demeanor on camera. That's for sure. It's, it's amazing. It almost seems like you've, you've known each other for 20 years. Yeah. And we, ha- yeah, and we haven't, we've known Jose and we've been in the same circles, but I mean, obviously it doesn't take long because we spend a week, a month together pretty much. Yeah. You know, we get a month off here, a month off there, but for the most part, the five of our crew that we film with, we've got me and Rush and then we've got Mikey who produces and is one of the, the in-boat cameraman. And then we've got Ben, who's our underwater guy. He flies the drone. He's a spear fisherman, diver. Um, he cut his teeth doing Shark Week stuff. And then we've got Jimbo, who's usually with us. And he came from the ESPN days of, you know, doing all of the ESPN shows, but especially working with Jose over the years. And he's done stuff with Into the Blue and Saltwater Sportsman. He produces Silver Kings. And so some really experienced talent, you know, and the, the common link for all of us was Jose. But when you're together that much, you know, and, and we got a lot, Rush and I do, we'd have to share rooms on the road and stuff. We'd be sitting there talking about fishing until one in the morning. Sick. You know, what's it like here? What's it like there? Yeah. And then for the first real episode, I took him to Baja and he was done. He had no choice. Like the grouper fishing and all, it just blew his mind. He'd never seen anything like it. And he showed me stuff in the Keys. Like I didn't know that existed. And I think I've sent a lot of guys to the Keys to fish. And he sent a lot of guys out our way to fish because they're both awesome some trees you know I, I tell people all the time his their fishery way better than southern california hmm. they just have so many options you can catch a 20 pound fish any day of the year over there in the dead of winter here it's very difficult to do but we have tuna during the summer and that you they don't have that they've got black fin which whatever yeah you know it's not our thing <laughs> for sure and he's like you guys the first time he took us he's like you guys want to go catch some tuna we're like what kind he's like black fin we're like uh is there any more bottom? Fish? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, poor man's tuna, but they're actually, they get a bad rap, but they're fun to catch. They are fun. Yeah. We do. We catch them with Jason over on the Gulf side and <clears throat> they get big yeah. over in there and we have a blast with them, but they, with our wives yeah. and stuff, that's like the perfect light. Tackle totally. Uh, they'll beat you and up. Quick to eat a popper, quick yeah. to eat a lure. Yep. That makes them fun and, and all that. But like, we want to know more about that bottom <laughs> fishery, catching Wahoo, all the stuff we don't have. Mm, you know yeah and i think that's what you want when you really start fishing a lot is where can i get the stuff i don't have or some of that stuff i saw in magazines growing up or whatever so it was just a good fit we all really enjoy hanging out you know and uh we've all become kind of like a family you know we get together one side or the other guys all know each other and it's just been a good deal man and it's kind of come down to it don't get me wrong it's a shitload of work and being gone that much sucks but we enjoy it and it's kind of like getting paid to go fish in really cool places. And the first couple of seasons, we didn't get paid anything. Like we would have made way more money sitting at home, but you know, get to go to all these rad places with your boys and catch some cool stuff and have a good time. And it's, it's just uh, something, you know, we'll probably do for a long time to come. Well, I'll tell you this much. We've said this, you know, not to you, to our friends, other fishermen that like to watch fishing all obsessed the same as we are. In my opinion, it's the best show, the best fishing show that I've ever seen. Like just, Man, just, you. just the shots, just like the B roll stuff that you guys put on there, and like yeah. the the balance and highlighting a product, but also shooting it in a way that like Taylor and I are like, oh, that's badass, or like I learned something, or yeah. like, I appreciate that scene when I'm out there on the water. Right. It's not just like zooming in on a fucking reel screaming every single time and focusing on the rod oh, it's, the worst. it's the worst it's it's it true is. it's it's a well well produced show it's awesome we, we've we've honestly probably i don't know how many hours of video we've watched we've watched every fishing show there's probably ever been in our lifetime and we've filmed a lot ourselves hundreds of thousands of hours of filming 
and it's insane. And that show is that sick. Means, it means a lot when guys like you who love it like we love it, who do it for a living, that it just means so much more to me, even than somebody coming up and telling us, you know, oh, they love the show or whatever, which I trust me, I totally appreciate. And I'm the most awkward guy on earth when that shit happens. <laughs> Oh, you guys, you'd love to see it. I'm like, ah, I don't really know what to do with my hands. I'm like, I'm really grateful, but. Reminds me of Austin that, Powers. Yeah, that scene from uh, Talladega. Oh, no. Talladega Nights. Talladega Nights. It's totally, I don't know. I'm on fire. <laughs> I'm yeah. on fire. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm so appreciative, so stoked, like. That it, it all makes it worthwhile. Like, obviously, we know our stuff's higher level. We're very proud of that. I don't think it's arrogant to say that. We put a lot of time, effort, and frankly, money. We spend the extra days to do that stuff. A lot of these other shows, dude, they go out and they're just trying to make a show as fast as possible. Right. They don't care if it's a shitty show. They don't care, you know, like if it's the same shit they've done over and over again or whatever. It's all about the bottom line. We never got into this to make money. You know, we're never going to get rich from it. It pays us about as much as anything else. So like if I go guide for a day, that's about what I'd make, yeah. you know, but we just love it. Love sharing. Um, I, I can tell you 100% Rush and I are not looking for notoriety. We're not trying to build 10 billion Instagram followers. We just want to do something we can be proud of. And like I said, when legit guys like yourselves, I mean, shit, I've known you guys for, a I don't even know how long. I was you just were looking, looking over, over 10 years. years of I, was, seminar I was a, stuff. I was a bloody deck right. member in 2010. And our first seminar was in 2012. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And I remember that I mean, in the box when we opened the box. I still have Yellowfin and Mahi BD Outdoors stickers. Oh, it's bloody deck we at that love point. It. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we love it. We yeah. love it. No, I mean, dude, it's a, it happens fast. And, and it's just it's a crazy – it's just been a crazy ride. I mean, you guys know the progression that we've been through as much as anyone. I've seen you guys go from being Groms on your dad's boat to now running the show and doing seminars. I couldn't be more stoked for you guys. You guys are doing it at a higher level in terms of putting out content, really respecting the fishery, trying to educate all of that stuff, you know? And I feel like that's like, I did, I did some seminars the other night and these guys, they're like, well, why do you do these seminars? I'm like, honestly, because one of you guys probably bought some of my bullshit or some (laughs) of my stuff somewhere along the line, join my website and put me in this position that I'm in today and the only way that I could say thank you is by driving my sorry ass a couple hours north, you know, and sitting here and showing you guys what I've learned. You know, I'm so lucky. I wasn't born with this. My dad wasn't a fisherman. I didn't grow up on a charter boat. I learned it all. And I, if, if I can get 10 more guys to catch a bluefin and get hooked for life, that's a big win, man. And anybody who tells you, especially in our state, that, you know, fishing is a growing sport's lying. It's a dying sport. Yep. Aside from this bump we got from COVID, like, Man, we got to share. You got you have this rad opportunity to get other guys fired up for it. You, you have to share. And, like, I'm not the guy that's going to keep all the secrets. When I was younger, for sure, I didn't tell anybody anything. And now it's like I'm telling – I was in the seminar the other night. I gave these guys some stuff that nobody knows, like, mm-hmm. except for our close circle of guys. And you know what? I don't feel bad about it because there's going to be two guys in the room that are smart enough to digest it and actually use it. And the rest of them are going to go back to that same spot they caught a fish at last year. Right. You know what I mean? And if you're going to if you're going to put in the extra time and do the research and read and do, uh, dude, I'm here to help you along the way if I can. And I'm here to learn from you. Yeah. Like, I don't know anything. I'm trying to learn everywhere we go, man. I'm trying to pick off a nugget and reapply it. You know, we're of the exact just, uh, exact same mindset. And the other aspect of the seminars that we truly believe in is you know, you get 200 novice tuna fishermen at a workshop. If you can be transparent with them and make them understand that we're really not doing much different than you guys already are. Here's right. our tweaks. When you're out yep. on the water, they're not encroaching on you. They're going out and using their instincts. They're finding yep. their own fish. You know, they're, they're yep. actually fishing. They're not following. So the people, that yep. knock, the people that knock that sharing of information and whatever else, we found that it's only helped us out there, honestly. Dude, we had this conversation yesterday. So I was telling you about the rental boats that we have here, right? I drive around a boat that's a giant penis extension. You can't miss me from a (laughs) mile away. You know what I mean? I'm that guy, especially on the West Coast. You don't see that many big center consoles. It's gotten a lot popular in the last couple of years, but, you know, I ain't hard to find. And there's these rental boat guys, and they're just stoked. They want to get out on the water. They're loving it. You got to love it a lot more than I do to go around on a 19-foot boat in shitty weather. Like, I have no part of that. But anyway, they'll come in when I'm trying to throw into a foamer and they'll run the foamer down. 
They'll cut me off. They'll do all. And it's like in my earlier days, I jump on your boat and kill you. In my <laughs> older days, when I'm a little more concerned about my blood pressure, I roll over to them and I educate them. And half of it scares the shit out of them, probably some big angry dude coming up in a giant boat looking straight down on you. But I'm like, man, you want to know why you're not catching any fish? Here is why. Here's what you need to be doing. Here's what I would appreciate if you did. We can work together on these schools. Da, 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 da. And I kind of dial them in in about three minutes instead of screaming at them and telling them about their mother and all that other stuff. And most of them are like, hey, man, thanks for the info, which I would have expected. Go F yourself, you know, all that other stuff. Most of these guys just don't know. And yeah, just no like clue. you said, yeah. if, dude, they want to know, you know, most of them want to know, at least to some extent. I truly don't feel that most, I feel like most fishermen don't want to really get to that next level. You know, they're just out there kind of doing what they do. But a lot of these guys, man, a little bit of direction, like you said, goes a long way. You made a friend for life instead of some guy that might be looking for you on the docks later on. Exactly. And you made him a better fisherman. And you're probably going to help the next 10 guys that he doesn't cut off or run over their chum line or whatever. What? And I try to incorporate that into every seminar. We don't fish in the dog pile. Work the edges. Yep. You guys, I'm sure, do the same thing, exact right? Exact same thing. I'm not a mile away. I might be a half mile away sitting over there by myself and I'm being a little more patient. I'm waiting for him to come through and God, it just pays dividends. They're more likely to bite. You know, you're not chasing your tail and all the good stuff that goes with that. So we're, we're so much of the same mindset. We really are I'm so lucky to do what I do. Like least I can do is help other guys and, you know, try to make them better fishermen and, and not lose my mind when they're not. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> this kind of goes along with everything you just said. Um, you know, you, you've, BD outdoors being being one aspect of your life. You have local knowledge. You have sat fish. You have fish dope. Um, I mean, you've done basically every type of marketing uh, that's that's possible, and, and hit and, and a lot like, of different aspects of fishing in your businesses. And you and you've been successful in in everything you know that you're doing currently. Um, what are some easy obtainable things you know t obtainable being the key word to this for some small business owners guys that are, are are starting their own charter company or they're starting their own fishing business or whatever that you can provide some insight to to help them cultivate their business you know to maybe Dude, to give them a little head start i got you 100 percent, and it's the easiest thing ever it's it is the most unique time in history where even the smallest charter fisherman who could be sabiki mackerel for a living to tourists in the bay has a voice and your voice is social media. It's just, it is an absolute no brainer. You see some of these charts. I don't do social media. Well, you're an idiot. Like it ain't that fucking hard to figure out. Get off your ass. Don't drink 17 drinks at night. Drink two, do some reading. You know what I mean? And step your game up. If there, you have got a world of potential customers out there that you could reach with a few clicks, maybe spend 10 bucks to promote a piece of content, learn what a hashtag is beyond making up stupid ones that you and your buddy think are funny that actually serve your business. Social media has changed everything. And when I say social media, I don't just mean Facebook and Instagram. I mean YouTube. And you guys know this. This is like you guys are the next level guys, right? You've been on social media as long as it's been out there. And you're not doing it to pump your own head up or you're not trying to be a hero. Put out quality information and you will get the returns a hundredfold over. You have the best social media bait ever as a charter operator. Pictures of big fish, right? It gets views. Okay, now I'm getting these views. How do I convert them into helping myself and my family? Tag that right to, you know, whatever you're doing and be consistent with it. It takes you 10 seconds to take a photo of your client and say, Bob and Susie from Iowa had a great time fishing with me today. Well, look what they caught. That's all you have to do. And if you do that for 300 days that you fish out of the year, you are going to see gains immeasurable and cost you nothing but a little bit of brain power. It's like it is such a unique time where dude, you have these people that are that are Instagram stars with millions of followers that never it was impossible 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you never would have got on MTV to be a star. You look at guys like Post Malone, you know, dude, he was 100 percent born on social media. And he is the, one of the biggest names in music. You, there's a million other guys just like him, you know, that are coming up and have done it all. Drake, how did Drake get his start? Social media. Until freaking, you know, 
Little Wayne saw what he was doing and blew him up. And it just, that's an opportunity he would not have had 10 years earlier. It's so, and, and you see some of these charter guys that really work social and they're running seven boats. And meanwhile, you're sitting there smoking cigarettes on the dock, waiting for somebody to walk up to you because you're too cool or too old school to use social media or just won't put the effort into it. Such a good point. I mean, it, it's part of the reason why we started this thing. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's another, you know, social media is great. Instagram, Facebook, you know, all the big. Now it's TikTok for us. You know, I mean, TikTok. Jesus. But like, even just this platform, people that kind of know us that might not be a client or a friend or like in our network. Now they see us shooting the shit and talking and being normal. It's like, it, it's an instant draw. Immediate. It's another way to humanize yourself to a bigger audience. Exactly. Right. I do seven people are like, oh man, you're so down to earth. And I'm like, what are you talking? I'm just a nerd that likes fishing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. you don't get to convey that when they see you buzzing by them, hauling ass in your boat or, you know, on TV or whatever. But like, dude, you come down to my dock while I'm getting fuel in the morning. And hey, I love your boat. I love your show. I'm like, dude, crawl on it. Make yourself at home. Climb all like, that's exciting shit. I wish somebody did that for me, you know, yeah. and just be human. It's not that hard. And I think when you get beyond the picture, you know, like, hey, here's a picture of my client holding up a fish. Here's a picture of me with a big fish. Once you get beyond that and really humanize yourself, you're, you're tight. That's like social media 3.0. Totally. You know, you're next level and shit. And you guys are doing a killer job of it. You guys have been doing a killer job of it with your videos and sharing information and all the stuff you guys have been doing over the years. Like you got you're set up now to do this for as long as you want to do it. Make a good living doing it. Feed your family and getting to do what you love. How many friends do you have that are accountants that go to work every day and want to put a pistol in their mouth? Totally. Like all you of them. want. We were all one of you them totally at, at some point in our lives and like being able to transition and turn your passion, like you guys say, into your profession. There's really no better, no better thing you can do in life, in my opinion. Dream come true. And yep. for me, I've got the extra dream because I don't have to run charters. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's dude, face it, that's a grind. It is bad clients, bad weather, bad fishing a million things, boats breaking. I have got the dream gig of all dream gigs, right? I get to pick a handful of guys I enjoy spending time with. They're actually foolish enough to give me money to take them fishing. <laughs> have a good time on the boat. I'm like, this guiding thing's awesome. I just get on like I normally talk shit, drink a few beers, catch a couple of fish, and I get money, and I don't have to pay for the fuel. Like, it's a win-win. It's awesome. You know? It's so awesome. It's, I, and that's why I'm just so happy to share, man. Happy to do, you know, anything. Like, I, I'm real big with CCA, any conservation stuff we do here, anything with the military kids, you're getting free t-shirts, free publicity, free hats. I feel like I've won the lottery. And if I didn't share it, I would be not the human being that I want to be. You know, you guys have been more than generous to, to us. And we've seen that generosity go beyond us, obviously. And um, I appreciate we that appreciate it. We appreciate, you know, your kind words as well. But before we get too far into wrapping up, uh, can you just kind of go through like each section of your business just like, you know, two, three, four bullet points just about like each thing that you guys do and provide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it all started with the website, which you guys are very familiar with. And the website has really evolved into all of these other things. Um, originally just a forum. That was it. You get on there, talk shit, do, you know, post pictures of your catch, make fun of people, all that good stuff. And it was really raunchy back in the early days. And by the time you guys came around, we had toned it down a lot, believe it or not, because, you know, I, it became something almost I like wasn't proud of. Like there was some stuff on there. You didn't want your mom to see, yeah. you know, and then in 2010, well, let's, let me back up 2008. I came up with a harebrained idea with my partners to kind of, we, we'd always used SST charts here because we're fishing albacore and they're super temperature dependent, right? They're always going to be on a break for the most part. There was just a really key thing to have. And so as we got smarter, we would print out an SST chart from Terrafin, our good buddy, Jeff. And then we would call our buddies and we'd make marks on the map for everywhere that, you know, they had caught fish and make little notes. And then I'd take a tide chart. I'd cut that out because that's important. I'd tape it to it. It sounds so stupid to say it now. Like this is like I'm. It's not stupid. We've, we've we've done, done this. Some weird shit. <laughs> too. I mean, like you talk about it, you're like wait, you used to print out a tie chart and tape it to it. Like, what the hell's wrong with you? So anyway, we would do all this prep the night before, right? And then go fish, and we'd catch fish. And then after a while, you start catching more fish than everybody. That was pretty cool, right? Everybody's kind of competitive to some extent, and you always want to be a, a you know a high stick or whatever you guys call it on your your coast, and so. One day I'm like, why are we doing all this? Like we could totally automate this. 
and Google Earth had just come out and we kind of got familiar with it. I'm like, what if we put an SST map in Google Earth and then we put icons where all the fish were caught and then you could print it out and plan your route and give it to your wife so she had a float plan for you. And then you could take it with you on the boat. You knew when the tides were, you knew where the fish were caught. You knew, I'm like, this is something we could sell. And I came up with Fish Dope. And that's how it all started. So Fish Dope was a subscription service that was mainly based around SSTs, but we gave you a daily report. And then as the years went on, we figured out that the daily report had more value than the SSTs because unfortunately in the world we live in, everybody just wants to go catch fish. They don't want to know the nuts and bolts behind it. I'm sure you see the same thing on your coast, right? They want numbers, not knowledge. And we say that a lot. So we started beefing up the reports and we started, we have a lot of friends in this business who are deckhands and captains. And, you know, we kind of worked out a system where, you know, you guys give us some information for what you saw in the water today combined with what we're doing. And we'll promote your charter or whatever it is you want to promote in exchange. And our reporters will act like the bullshit filter. And so we got reporters who really know fishing, who really know these guys, who know what's going on. And they get all this information and they compile it every single day, except for Christmas Day. And they put out a, a daily report. Huh. And then it, it, dude, it took off. It took, it went crazy. We were hoping we get a couple hundred subscribers. We were in the thousands. Of That's those sick. Times. Sick. And you start doing the math on $179 a year times a few. Yep. Oh, it, yeah. We were Netflix Money. before Netflix was You're Netflix. going to Puerto Vallarta a couple more times. <laughs> A couple more times. And that's how the whole business started. And so like prior to that, we were making some money, but we just reinvested. Me and my partner, Jason, had jobs. Uh, BD was a hobby. So we just put the money back into technology, into the bank. You know, after a few years, we started making some real money. We're like, dude, we can go buy a boat. So we went and bought a brand new World Cat. We got Suzuki to hook us up, Raymarine, all this good stuff. We're living high on the hot. We got a free brand new bitch and boat. And then Fish Dope came and it's like, okay, this is a business. And somewhere around like uh, 2009, my other business, because of the recession, cratered. I lost everything. And my mom died and my grandma died and all this shit. I had the worst year you could ever imagine, 2009. And my mom's dream was to do BD full time. And so I didn't have a job to quit, pretty much. I could have gone and done something else and probably made a bunch of money. But I'm like, I'm going to try this website thing full time. And then 2010... We uh, we hired the editor of Marlin Magazine, Charlie Levine, and we built out an editorial plan. And so now we're a legit magazine, right? But we're online, and that opened us up to a slew of new advertisers and partners who didn't just want to buy a banner ad, didn't understand a forum, thought forums were bad, all that stuff. And it's just, you know, like it seems like every few years we come up with another harebrained idea. Somewhere around like 15, I think, we rolled out local knowledge. That was a fun deal and still is fun to this day. And then about... A year ago, we came up with Sapfish, which we've been working on, honestly, for a long time, but it's fish dope without all the daily reports. So right now, we can really only provide reports for the Southern Cal Bite, which we call the lower half of the state and into Mexico. But without the reports, we've still got some sick SST charts, the best in the business. I'll, I'll represent that all day long. And we have some cool mapping technology that lets you use those. And on the app, even see your boat. You know, you download the app into the map, and you can see where you're at relative to that temp break. And so we rolled that out, but we don't want to confuse the market in Southern California. So it was mostly an East Coast and Gulf product, and it's done phenomenally well. It continues to grow. Um, and, dude, it's, I don't even know what the next thing is going to be. It's you awesome. know, we're, we're just loving life and working hard and, and getting returns. And, and, you know, just like we talk about fishing, we're trying to sharpen our game. We're not the best at social media. I mean, we've got a bunch of followers and stuff, but we're, we're learning every day. We're learning e-marketing and retargeting. And, you know, now we've really got a product with Sapfish where it's got very broad appeal in a bunch of markets where we don't know anybody. So we're learning to market Sapfish using social ads and editorial and Google AdWords. And it's just, it's an ever, ever evolving deal. We're marketing like, Sapfish I mean, yeah. right now. I was playing around on it last night. If you are a Northeast Canyon fisherman and you haven't checked out Sapfish, you need to check out Sapfish. Just the progression and being able to like legitimately it's hit insane. play change your whole time spectrum and then be able to watch those eddies you know obviously you're still getting cloud cover and everything else you're going to get in sea surface temperature uh data but like it's a it's a very very well designed application thank you thank you a lot of these other other services are made by programmers we've got an in-house phd who's a marine biologist and he manages all of our maps and handles all that he knows where to find an albacore and what that water looks like and how to highlight that in an SST map or, you know, any of the other components. Like we bring a fishy aspect to the science 
that I don't think a lot of other guys do. It's a lot more science than it is fish. And, you know, you guys know science will only take you so far and fishing knowledge will only take you so far. If you can combine the two, you know, you're really on to something, I feel like. Yep. Yeah, totally. And it, it the whole idea, especially, geez, now is save you time, save you fuel. Yep. You make one wrong turn now, I mean, your boat probably gets as bad a mileage as my boat, one mile per gallon, and like seven dollars a gallon you don't have time to mess around or you know fuel to burn you're running 100 plus miles you want to be on the meat and that's going to help 100 percent. you want to land right on is what we say like you don't want to goof around or a lot of times when i'll use it is like if i'm on the meat all week and it disappears oh now we got to go actually hunt again right you mm-hmm. can't drive out to the same mm-hmm. area pull up my maps you know oh here's a piece of water i bet you they went there yeah and find that piece of water <laughs> and then back back up a few days and see how developed that piece of water is check the chlorophyll make sure you're not looking at warm green water and man it's just it's another tool and we say it's like the ultimate fisherman's toolbox you got everything you need to catch offshore you know fish right there in your phone it's awesome <sighs> dude um we've been going for over an hour and a half we appreciate your time we appreciate you it's uh it's this is actually our first time ever actually sitting down face to face having a legit conversation despite all our years in pei and all that just always flying around going a million miles an hour and i we appreciate every second of the same thing dude i I love what you guys are doing huge fan i'm definitely gonna get out there and fish with you guys i would extend the invitation again I know we can learn a bunch from you guys out here. You've been catching bluefin a lot longer than we have and probably have it a lot more refined. Please come out here, man, and keep keep doing all the good work you guys are doing. Wherever we can help out, you know we're there to support you. We'll couch crash in November. Perfect. Once we're all yep. wrapped up. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring it on. Um, so thanks again. Uh, obviously, we'll post all your information, businesses on the description here. You guys will be able to follow everything Ollie's doing. Season 7 starts in April of Local yeah. Knowledge. Yep. Yeah, we'll start. The preview will roll out like the first week. There's something we're doing different there, too. So please, I'd encourage anybody who likes the show, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. We are actually the first legitimate show that's moving away from television. We're 100% Perfect. on demand now. Perfect. 100%. So yeah. you can get all of our episodes. Every episode we've ever done is on YouTube for free. You can go to your favorite app store, iOS, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Sunsmart. Smart. We have a local knowledge app. Watch all of our episodes for free. We're on Waypoint. We're on the Waypoint channel on Samsung Smart TV. And what this is going to allow us to do now is we can film over a 12-month season. With the TV model before, we had deadlines and guns to our head that wouldn't let us do a lot of the stuff we wanted to, particularly in the fall. And and it's very ambitious on our part, but we're going to release a new piece of content every single week starting in April for an entire year. We'll release a new show a month, a preview, and then a couple of how-tos or like a deep dive where we go meet with a scientist or whatever. But that's our goal, and we really want to blow up our YouTube is one piece of content a week on schedule every single week. So. Hope you guys will give us a follow on YouTube and, and help spread the word. Absolutely. Um, well, a couple things. One, do you call your albacores penguins as a nickname over there? Because that's what we call them here. Penguins with the little like fins. <laughs> no, but that's pretty good. All right, there's penguins. <laughs> I like that. Seasick jokes. Like that. Our go-to seasick joke is customer is seasick. One of us is seasick, God forbid. Um, if you start to taste hair in your mouth, swallow because that's your asshole. There's a seasick joke for you. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that's actually OGs. That's and we're going to end this. At, we're going to end this on old Greg's three words of fishing wisdom. Remember, you can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last one, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight, everybody. <laughs> Dude, thank right you so much. Thank you. This was awesome. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch and 100% want to get you over here and go over there. And uh, let's make it happen. Be sweet. All right, boys. Good luck this season. Be safe. All right, dude. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. See ya. Take care. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Seabros Fishing Podcast. If you would like more information about today's guest, our episode, and show sponsors, or if you want to order hats and apparel, please visit our website at seabrosfishing.com. You can also stay up to date in all the latest Seabros Fishing content and podcast episodes by following us on Instagram at Seabros Fishing. Finally, To book a trip with us through our family-run charter fishing company, please visit MassBayGuides.com or see our latest updates and fishing reports by following MassBayGuides on Instagram and Facebook.